Good afternoon, everybody. This is Max Joel at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Uh, we still have some people entering the webinar, so we're going to wait just a couple minutes longer to get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Max Joel. I am with the New York Sun team at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today. Today we'll be discussing requirements uh, from the New York State Historic Preservation Office for PV system development in New York. Uh, this is a very important topic, and I want to thank my colleagues uh, from the State Historic Preservation Office for helping us organize this webinar and developing a lot of great content that they'll be sharing uh, with you all today. To kick things off, I'm going to briefly introduce the NYSERDA and State Historic Preservation Office staff that are on today's webinar before uh, turning it over to the presentation. But just before doing that, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everyone who is attending is on mute right now and will remain on mute. Uh, we have uh, so many people attending today that we won't be opening up uh, the lines for discussion. Uh, however, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so to participate in that, you will be able to uh, enter your questions in the Q&A uh, box, which you'll find at the lower right hand uh, corner of your screen. Um, if it's if it's not expanded, you can just uh, click the little. Um, uh, the little carrot next to it and it'll uh, expand and you can type your question. Um, feel free to enter questions at any point during the presentation about the topic as it comes up. Uh, we'll be collecting those and organizing them uh, at the end and then uh, addressing your questions uh, during our, our Q&A at the end. Uh, the presentation itself will last uh, about an hour and then we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. Uh, so without any more uh, housekeeping, um, I'll be getting, uh, I'll just be very briefly introducing the staff who will be participating. Um, from NYSERDA on the line today, we have uh, myself, Max Joel, uh, my colleague Frank Mace, Allison Nelligan, and Candace Rossi. Uh, Candace also serves as our agency's historic preservation officer, uh, so is uh, within the New York Sun team at NYSERDA the main point of contact. Um, and I already see one question uh, about a, an important uh, housekeeping item, will this be recorded? The answer is yes, it is being uh, recorded right now and will be posted on the New York Sun uh, website. Um, so to introduce the team at the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, we'll have John Bonafide, uh, Kathy Howe, uh, we will have Beth Cumming, and then uh, we will also have Nancy Herter speaking today. 
And with that, I will turn it over to John to kick off the presentation and I'll just say thank you all once again uh, for attending today. Thank you, Max, and thanks to the team at NYSERDA. Uh, this uh, uh, training opportunity kind of came about with a conversation Max and I had uh, several months ago, and it's taken a while to pull it all together, but uh, NYSERDA did a great job uh, bringing us together, and we're glad to take this time to talk to uh, the attendees about solar um, and what our role is for those of you who have not worked at our office before and help clarify some of the mysteries or questions uh, folks have had about uh, the process that we oversee. Uh, so with that, I, uh, I will ask uh, my colleague Beth to for next slide. Uh, again, the agenda for the training today will be an overview that I'll present and I'll just to touch on the laws that we administer, which may interact with your projects. Uh, that will be followed by a, a discussion by Kathy Howe, who will talk about above ground resources survey. Uh, archaeology survey will be next uh, with uh, Nancy Herder and uh, cultural resource information system or the CRIS system, which is how we accept projects for our review. Uh, Beth Cumming, who's also the lead of our technical reviewers, uh, will uh, be overseeing that. And then we'll wrap up uh, the presentation with a discussion of what adverse findings are and what mitigation means. And that'll be followed, as Max said, by a uh, Q&A session after that. Beth, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so again, this portion of the presentation will deal with uh, laws and uh, our, our role and why you uh, will be consulting with us. And uh, by uh, introduction, I'm the director of the Technical Preservation Services Bureau and the heads of our uh, three programs that are involved in reviewing your projects uh, will also be the speakers that will follow me. Next slide. So the State Historic Preservation Office uh, is also uh, for state projects known as the New York State Division for Historic Preservation. We are housed within the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Uh, we are responsible under several laws to provide state, federal, and local uh, agencies with expertise on historic and archaeological resources. Uh, when we talk about our involvement, anytime a state or federal agency issues a permit or a license or provides funding in any amount to a project, that agency has to consult with our office to ensure that cultural or historic resources are not directly or indirectly impacted by those uh, funded or licensed projects. So it's a pretty broad swath. We'll talk about uh, the kind of scope that entails, uh, but I will tell you, we, we work with about 200 state and federal agencies on a regular basis. Uh, the sections of law that are involved that bring us into the process, if you have a federal permit, if you need a 404 uh, Army Corps water certification, uh, or uh, any kind of federal permit, you would, uh, see our activity under Section 106 or the National Historic Preservation Act. If you're dealing with a state project, uh, state agencies, and you're doing a, you need a DEC speedies permit or NYSERDA is providing funding to you for your project, for example, uh, that triggers the state law, Section 1409 of New York State Parks, Rec, and Historic Preservation Laws. And finally, all of the projects that are reviewed locally generally go through a local seeker process. But we're not directly involved in that, many uh, local entities, planning boards, zoning boards, town boards will seek our input if they have historic uh, resources in the area of your projects or if they know that there's archaeological sensitivity. Um, and they may also seek our comments uh, as advisors to their board. Uh, generally, seeker and either of the two other laws, state and federal, are, don't interact with each other very much. Usually, our, our comments under the state or federal law would become part of the seeker documents for the locality. Sometimes it's a different process, but uh, generally that's um, how the organization of how the laws interact works. Uh, Beth, if you want to go to the next slide. So what does consultation involve, uh, actually involve? Uh, our role under law, both state and federal laws, is to assist agencies, both state and federal, in identifying what properties may be historic. Those can be properties which have been uh, previously listed on the New York State or National Register of Historic Places, or they can be properties which are eligible for the listing. Our responsibilities also include looking at buildings that are 50 years old or older that may be adjacent or within an area of impact for your project to determine whether or not those properties may be eligible for the registers. And 
Kathy will talk more about that as we get a little farther into the presentation. Uh, once we've identified the historic resources, the next job for our office is to determine if the project we're looking at uh, will have an adverse effect on the identified resources. Uh, once that is identified, then the process continues uh, where we would ask you to look at alternatives or we actually be asking the involved agencies who would then ask you. Uh, sometimes it can be a little more direct than that with us working directly with you. Uh, to find out whether there are ways that we could avoid or minimize the impacts we've identified that your project may have on the resources uh, that we would um, have, have noted uh, as part of your project uh, development. Uh, if there are no ways to avoid, to minimize, or lessen the impacts, we would then uh, come to consensus on that and work to uh, find ways to mitigate uh, those uh, impacts, which is uh, a section we'll talk about at the very end of the presentation, if there are no reasonable alternatives that might avoid those impacts. So it's a pretty linear process and a series of steps. Um, and uh, it, it, it goes generally smoothly uh, for the most part. Uh, sometimes there can be hiccups, and sometimes if you're not aware that our agency becomes involved, it can seem like uh, uh, you know a Byzantine process that you've been dropped into. Uh, but we do this quite frequently. We're, we're pretty adept at what we do and try to be as efficient as we can be. And we'll talk about the efficiency in a minute. Uh, Beth, next slide. So to give you a sense of, of our, our involvement with solar projects, and just by, by magnitude of scale, uh, since 2016, we've reviewed about 1,100, a little over 1,100 solar projects have come into our office for evaluation. The pie chart kind of breaks them down. You can see in 2016, it's a pretty small number as it is in 2017. You can see it begin ticking up in 2018. Uh, 2019, we were approaching 300 projects and then a real bump last year to over almost 450 projects. So obviously those numbers won't be going down anytime soon. So we do see a lot of activity in the category of solar projects. But just to give you an overall sense of, of uh, how this fits into the regular work program, of 446 projects that we saw come into the office last year, we had over 7,200 projects total coming in from uh, you know, almost 200 state and federal agencies. So it's a, it's a fairly small percentage of the work we see, uh, but obviously an area that is developing. Uh, so we continue to try to find better ways to uh, streamline the process for those that are doing the work um, in this area, you as the developers or consultants to developers, and, uh, you know, the hope is that we can find uh, through seminars like this and working with NYSERDA easier ways to speed through the process. And one of those is our guidance we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, next slide. So for the solar projects, uh, that 1,124 solar projects, which are all different sizes uh, that have come in since 2016, that includes uh, two megawatt ground projects to uh, a large 500 megawatt project we're seeing now. So it's the full gambit of, uh, of projects. Um, to date, we've, we've uh, completed our review in about 788, 790 uh, solar projects. About 80% of those involve less than 20 acres of project impact area. So most of the projects we're seeing are still pretty small, still five megawatts, uh, community solar and smaller projects uh, that uh, made up most of what we've seen over the, over the past several years. But within that, that fairly small group of 788 projects, uh, we've identified uh, over 1,600 historic properties, which are within the impact area of those projects. We've also seen 268 archaeological sites uh, that fell within the actual disturbance area, so where panels are being placed or roads are going in. So a number of resources do get impacted even by these very small projects. Um, and to uh, expand upon kind of the steps in the process of all of those projects and all of those resources impacted, only three of the 788 that we reviewed were found to have adverse effects that we could not find ways to minimize or avoid. So all in all, how uh, the process works fairly well, and we certainly credit that with uh, uh, a large number of uh, interested developers who move panels around or try to find uh, active ways to be flexible and avoid these resources when they can. So we're, we're uh, pretty um, pleased so far with the results we're seeing with these projects. And it's been a program where uh, we've effectively been able to find ways uh, collaboratively to uh, minimize impacts to historic resources. Next slide. 
So when we talk about adverse effects, um, what are they? Adverse effects are found when an undertaking, which is any project, alters directly or indirectly any of the characteristics of a historic property that qualify it for inclusion in the state or national registers of historic places. And when we talk about resources, we're talking about both buildings uh, and uh, archaeological sites. Uh, adverse effects can include the introduction of new visual elements. Both our laws, the state and federal law, specifically name that as examples of adverse effect. Uh, adverse effects diminish the integrity of a property's location, design, materials, workmanship, uh, filling association, or setting. That's again is the definition of an adverse effect when we uh, read the laws. And in particular, with solar projects, unlike DOT road projects or new construction of high rise buildings or things like that, the impact is almost exclusively to the setting of the historic properties, at least for the above ground resources. When it comes to archaeological sites, Generally, the impact is is more destructive just because the, the sites have to be either removed or parts of the sites have to be removed if a, a facility can't be worked around them. Uh, when we talk about setting in particular, we're talking about uh, the character of the place in which the property played its historic role. So when we talk about a historic farm that may be eligible for the registers, there's acreage, there may be outbuildings, uh, there may be a sense of kind of a bucolic setting that goes with that. And those settings can be altered by the introduction of uh, commercial construction. It can be in impacted by uh, wind turbines going up nearby. It can be impacted by fields of uh, solar uh, panels going in into what once were uh, productive agricultural fields. It's not to say it's right or wrong. It's just to say, by definition, those things do have uh, adverse effects to the setting that we have to talk about uh, finding ways to, as I've mentioned earlier, avoiding, minimizing, or if we can't do that, mitigating. Uh, next slide, Beth. So, as a result of seeing, you know, 1,000, 1,100 solar projects in the past few years, we were trying to play catch up. Prior to 2016, we may have seen one or two, and almost all our solar projects were roof mounted up until that point. Uh, as it became coming in, we were dealing with a large number of projects coming in, and we found that staff, of which there are about 28 staff in our office that deal with these projects, and all our projects actually, but uh, with that many people on projects, we were finding that we were giving out different information. Uh, participants or people coming in weren't sure of what they needed to uh, uh, send in to us. And in an effort to try to uh, find a consistent way to let developers uh, know what they had to submit, that we weren't changing things from developer to developer or year to year or project to project, uh, we, we uh, produced the, the uh, state historic uh, guidelines for solar facility development and cultural resource survey work. Uh, last year in the summer, and that uh, caught the attention of a lot of people because they, uh, you know, not seen it before. Some had not heard of us before, but essentially the guidance was put together based on the best practices we found from the projects we've received to date. Uh, it's a, it's a living document. We we continue to make updates as we learn more about these projects and the project scopes change. Uh, but part of today's discussion really is to focus on uh, walking through the steps of this uh, uh, resource survey uh, guidance. And it is guidance. Uh, it's not policy. We are not policy or a uh, regulatory agency. We are uh, we provide assistance to other agencies. But again, the goal here is to provide consistency. So as projects developers move forward with uh, either uh, uh, doing their first project in New York State or coming into New York State or doing successive projects in New York State, they know what to expect each time based on the scale of the projects they're uh, they're working on. And again, even within this set of guidance, it is guidance and. Uh, contact with our office is always uh, uh, strongly encouraged early in your development process uh, so that it, uh, you know, we can talk about issues that may arise if you have concerns about things like the guidance and want to talk about that before you submit material uh, to our office. Uh, next slide, Beth. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the next part of our presentation, which is Kathy Howe. Kathy is the uh, coordinator of our survey and national register unit. Uh, her role and the role of her staff is to take the properties that are submitted to by the office and to make determinations based on the National Register criteria of which ones uh, meet eligibility for the Na state and national register for other historic places. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Um, next slide, please, Beth. Thank you. So let's start with sort of what is a building survey? So building survey is basically taking stock 
or an inventory of above ground properties. So think of the survey as the identification piece of your project. Uh, the survey process involves field work, data collection, research. Um, it provides information, as John said, about properties 50 years of age or older within a specific geographic area. It includes mapping, photographs, descriptions, and so on. And although we talk about it as a building survey, I kind of think of it more broadly as an inventory of all of the different types of properties that might form a sense of place, a historic a landscape, a historic place. Think of um, many of you um, have done surveys in the past and you probably dealt a lot with, for example, farmsteads where you have a farm house and barns and fields and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So John's gone over this. Um, so why conduct a building survey? Again, this is part of the process, the SHPO review process to identify and evaluate resources that may be potentially impacted by the solar array, um, meeting the environmental review requirements of the laws that John mentioned. And when we get into historic, we're generally talking about properties, as he said, that are either already listed on the National Register or are determined eligible. It's the same level of review that we give, whether it's listed or eligible. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, okay, um, so very very briefly, I wanted to go over the National Register of Historic Places. So the National Register was established under law as part of the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. It is the official list of properties that are significant in our past and uh, properties that are listed on the National Register are also um, are listed on our parallel state register. We have well over 130,000 properties in our state that are actually listed. And in addition to the listed properties, we have tens of thousands that have been determined eligible for the National Register. So next slide, please. Um, okay. so. Um, when we look at buildings, when my staff here in the Survey and National Register unit look at buildings, we're, we're making evaluations to determine, hey, are these meeting certain criteria? And those criteria are the National Register criteria. Our decisions are not based on tastes or likes or dislikes or certain biases. Um, it, it, we uh, are using the National Register criteria as our guide. And here is um, a, a bulletin that's available from the National Park Service, which gets into the National um, Register criteria. So broadly speaking, a property has to meet one or more of the criteria, which we'll get into. And in addition to that, a property has to possess integrity um, or certain sort of physical features like design, materials, workmanship, also setting, location, association, feeling, and so on. Um, and I want to stress that just because we're asking for properties that are 50 years of age or older, that doesn't mean that it, we just automatically call them eligible just because of age. Age is just one piece of the larger puzzle. Again, a property must not only meet at least one of the criteria, but it also has to retain historic integrity to convey its significance. And it's our job to, to evaluate that. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the four criteria um, from that are defined here. Um, so generally speaking, you've got to meet one of these four, criterion A, Properties that are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. So to think of A as history. Criterion B, properties uh, that are associated with the lives of persons significant in our past. So B is about important people, whether that it's locally or nationally. C is a little bit more wordy. Uh, criterion C that embody the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction 
or that represent the work of a master or possess high artistic values or that represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction. Um, in that case, think of generally a historic district, maybe a grouping of buildings that are related um, in terms of perhaps their architectural design and trends. So for criterion C, very wordy, but just generally think of like design, architectural design, construction types, et cetera. Um, and then criterion D, and I will leave this for Nancy, but that really has to do more with um, the potential of a property, a site to yield information important in prehistory or history. So that's think archeology span for criterion D. Next slide, please. As I said, um, we're asking that when you undertake your surveys that you record properties in an adjacent to your um, site that are 50 years of age, generally 50 years of age or older. Uh, next slide. And then one of the things we do when we evaluate properties is we also say, well, is this important locally? You know, most of the properties that we evaluate are going to be determined eligible because of local significance, such as this um, schoolhouse in Queemans, or you might have properties such as this armory on the lower right that's important at the statewide level of history, or more obvious ones, uh, there are fewer of these that are important nationally, such as the, the Brooklyn Bridge. Next slide, please. So, um, under the National Register criteria, what, what types of properties can, could be determined eligible? Well, buildings, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it could be a house, a barn, a church, a hotel, a factory. Uh, next slide, please. Well, I don't think that many of you are going to be encountering um, boats, <laughs> um, but, you know, structures um, does encompass boats, you know, transportation resources, but you might be, when you're doing your work, encountering um, engineering structures, such, or en industrial structures, but engineering structures, for example, here, um, a bridge is an example of a structure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, objects could be determined eligible either on their own or as part of something bigger, like a cemetery. So here we're looking at um, statues and monuments, small scale sculpture, for example. And next slide. And also sites could be determined eligible. So I'm sure many of you are gonna run into, as you're doing surveys, um, rural cemeteries, for example. Um, so I wanted to show that, but sites could be anything. Um, it could be an archaeological site. It could be um, a battlefield, but um, generally we see a lot of cemeteries coming in as sites. Um, and um, so I wanted to show these pictures here because it's good to get, you know, solid photographic documentation, which we'll talk about. And next slide. And finally, the other sort of resource type is a collection, a related collection of buildings or sites or structures, objects, um, all in one sort of geographic area, which is known as a historic district. So districts are made up of you know, many things. Um, it, we have rural uh, landscape districts. We have ones in more dense villages or urban settings. It could be agrarian, residential, industrial, and so on. Um, this is the recently listed Malone Historic District up in the North Country. Now I want to um, kind of quickly go through the some examples of the National Register criteria that I previously mentioned to you. Next slide. So um, we talked about the property types. Now let's talk about the criteria. So criterion A, as I said, was properties that are associated with broad patterns of events and history, things important from our past. So here are some examples of just, you know, a, um, a wooden uh, grain mill that tells us a lot about the history and local agriculture and industry of an area. We have lower left a simple wooden baseball grandstand that tells us about uh, recreation in the early 20th century. And even the site of Woodstock, um, that tells us a lot about social history, music history of the 1960s. Next slide. 
Criterion B, which we mentioned, and this is all about people. So here I'm showing, um, you know, people that have uh, done things important uh, in our in the past, important contributions to history in any area from art to music. It's and so on. We're showing uh, uh, the jazz musician, trumpeter Louis Armstrong and his house out in Queens, New York. And next slide. Finally, many properties that you're going to be working with may fall under the criterion C, which again thinks sort of design architecture, whether it's in a district of early 20th century houses to a formal garden. Um, my lower right, we see um, a government building. So that, that's an example of things that are important for their design. And criterion D is next on the next slide, please. Again, I'll, I'll leave this for Nancy, but as I said, criterion D is sites that are important in history or prehistory. Um, okay, so let's dig in right now to the next slide because I wanna, now that we've kind of gone over broadly, what is the National Register criteria? That's what we here at the SHPO apply to what you're gonna be sending us. Let's get into some of the nuts and bolts here. Now, as John said, um, I think he said something like 80% of the um, projects we're getting for solar um, um, surveys or solar projects are on the smaller side. Um, so our guidance is sort of scaled. And I'm going to talk largely about solar arrays covering less than 20 acres. Um, next slide, please. So solar arrays covering less than 20 acres. Again, we want documentation of all properties 50 years of age or older. Um, and while we're not asking for a full blown survey report at all, we need some, you know, a basic level of uh, information on buildings in your project area. Next slide. So, again, uh, what do we may mean by adjacent? People often ask us this, this. So, um, buildings that are located on a parcel next door to your the solar array to the project or maybe a property that might be on a parcel directly sort of across the street from your project that's sort of our definition of adjacent what kind of documentation do we need we're going to need street address location on the map we're going to need digital images again if you have something like a farmstead we're going to want the main building and outbuildings um, we're not going to want to see Google or Bing images. We, I mean, we can do that. You're the boots on the ground. We need that information showing you know, front and sides of the main building and the outbuildings. Give us an approximate date of construction. If you can give us a brief description of the property, that's wonderful. If you know a little bit about its history, that's also nice to have. Uh, and also feel free to reach out to the municipal historian. They may uh, have a wealth of information and may shed some light on a particular property. Um, you can submit all of this information as a single PDF, or you can submit it one sort of one building at a time in our Chris system. We'll talk about that later when Beth gives the presentation. Uh, next, I want to go over a few tips to keep in mind. Again, Beth's going to drill down into this more than I, but um, this is our cultural resource information system known as CRIS. This is where you're going to go. I'm showing this slide because when you're first submitting your project, you're going to, this is where you're going to go. You're going to submit it into the consultation module and do not submit it into this thing, even though it says next to it, independent survey, you do not want to submit your project in independent survey, okay? I just wanna make that clear. People sometimes get confused by that. So you wanna pick the thing called consultation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a few other tips to keep in mind. These are some of the basic things we want. Um, again, Beth will go over this, but what uh, keep in mind, we'd like to know, like, what is the name of your official name of your project? What's the megawatts? Um, also, really important for us to understand so we know where this fits in is we'd like to know the acreage for the actual solar array for where you're actually installing equipment um, and then also 
the total acreage of your project area. So we want both of those acreages. That's very helpful for us to know that up front. And again, whatever you can give us up front so we don't have to go back and forth with you, that'll be smoother for both of us. And we'll get you through. Um, we also, um, you know, want to know if there's buildings on or adjacent, check the box there and, and give us a good description, just a general description of what you're doing. Um, next slide, please. Okay, also important and John sort of mentioned, you know, various agencies that might be involved when you submit the project. Helpful to know from the outset, if you do your homework on this and know from the outset, oh yeah, I'm going to need an Army Corps permit. There's some sort of stream crossing or I need DEC to also weigh in, et cetera. So, or and obviously NYSERDA and so on. So be sure to enter all of the agencies that might have some involvement and uh, say in this project. Um, that's helpful to us. Next slide will be um, the other thing you're going to want to do, and Beth will also show this, is you want to kind of get a feeling like, well, what do we know? What what historic resources might SHPO already have in their CRIS database that might be in or adjacent to my project site? So in this case, I'm showing a, there's a yellow dot, and that signifies, yellow signifies that, oh, that's a National Register listed property. So that's good to know. Uh, next slide. And you're going to attach to your project some maps. So helpful for us to have just an overall project location map shown on the left. And then also we will want a um, site plan that will show us actually where the proposed solar installation is going within that overall project um, location. So th these are the kinds of maps we're asking for. Next slide. Um, okay, now some tips on some of the photographic and other documentation. So you're doing your survey, you're providing us information on buildings 50 years of age or older. So here's a case where the consultant did a great job because they gave us a photo key this happened to be a farmstead and they you know, took photos of the main house, the outbuildings. As I said, remember you people, you guys are the boots on the ground. We're not out there. Um, and so the more you can do to help us with photographic documentation so we can understand the buildings and their settings, so much the better. Uh, basic information is gonna be needed on the buildings, the address, um, when it was built, if you've got a little description or whatever. Um, next uh, slide, please. And now I wanted to show you, so this related to this was the actual photographic documentation. So for this farmstead, the consultant did a good job because they gave us um, not being your Google photos, they give us actual photos, <laughs> images that they took um, carefully, you know, showing the front and the sides of the building. Um, they were careful also to do the best they could to actually um, get the view so that they weren't obscured by trees and vegetation. That's always tough. I know sometimes you just can't avoid the trees, but do your best you can to avoid uh, trees because um, it's hard to see. <laughs> so. If you have to move a little bit to take your picture, please do that. Uh, next slide, please. And they were great. They gave us a sense of the setting. They gave us a sense of well, what outbuildings do we have here? The carriage barn, various sheds, and so on. So really give us an understanding of the setting through the photos. That can be very helpful because as John said, it's, uh, setting is one of the key things that we're gonna be kind of looking at if something's determined eligible and how your project is going to or may have an impact on setting. Um, next slide. And as I said, um, you, you probably are going to encounter historic cemeteries. Do your best to give us some overall views of the cemetery. Uh, you know, get out of your car, get up close, take some overall views, get even closer. Great to have a few representative images of some of the headstones. These are wonderful, beautiful carved headstones here, which tell us as the reviewers a bit about the history, the people. I'm not saying you have to photograph every single headstone, but you know, a few are nice and helpful. And I do want to say that if you've ever been to it, um, the Find a Grave website called Find a Grave, that website can be particularly helpful. Um, okay, next slide. 
So what does the SHPO do once you submit all of this uh, building survey data to us? We're going to review it to make sure it's complete. Hopefully it is, so we don't have to do any back and forth with you. Um, we will then, if we have enough information, we're going to determine the historic status of a property. Is it already National Register listed? Was it previously determined eligible? And if so, is it still eligible? Are we going to call it newly determined eligible? Or in many cases, it's not eligible. It may be 50 years of age, but just doesn't meet those criteria. Um, and then if it's eligible, we're going to do, to do a determination of eligibility, saying very briefly why it's eligible. Once we do our thing, um, Beth and John, they're good, the tech reviewers, they're gonna take a look at it to assess impacts. Next slide, please. So um, this is just a brief you know, blurb on why this particular property um, in the town of Avon was eligible as in a, a sort of transitional Italian at Farmstead with the outbuildings and so on. So that's our determination. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So I very sort of quickly, I guess, <laughs> went through um, the bulk of the solar array projects, which are less than 20 acres. But I am gonna touch quickly on things that kind of verge beyond that. I and mean, it's all scalable. We've got solar arrays in the 20 to 50, 50 to 100 acres, and then the big ones, 100 acres or more for the solar arrays. So as I said, this guidance is very scalable. Next slide, please. So this is different, slightly different from what we're gonna ask of the simpler, smaller project. In this case, we're really going to ask that the, in this case, the consultant is going to, you may ask for a large, um, actually for a zone of visual impact here, which is shown here on the right. Um, I think hard to see in the slide, but I guess the pink is showing areas of visibility from this project. So we're going to ask the consultant to do some mapping that shows, shows the zone of visual impact. The ZVI, as it's called, is basically GIS analysis of all the areas that are going to have positive visibility of the solar array based upon um, bare earth topography. So not vegetation, but bare earth photography. Next slide. As I said, scalable, depending on how big these larger scale ones are. So 20 to 50 acres, we're going to ask that the ZVI kind of take a look at properties that fall within the ZVI one half mile on out. 50 to 100 acres, we're gonna go, that ZVI is gonna look about a mile out, what's visible a mile out. And for the really big ones, we're gonna ask two miles out. Next slide. And um, important to note that our guidance does ask that these large scale survey projects are completed by um, a, what's called a 36 CFR 61 qualified consultant. This is usually someone with background in preservation history, architectural history, and so on. These are, um, this is something determined by the National Park Service. Um, code, and it's in there in the Code of Federal Regulations. The consultant, as I said, is going to give us the proposed ZVI. They're going to give to us a methodology and a work plan. We're gonna put that into Chris before they go out and do the field work. Then we're gonna review that ZVI. We're gonna review their methodology, their plan. And we will then um, give them access, should they request this, to use our Trekker mobile survey application. So we have a um, one-year-old now, Trekker um, survey app, which will really help consultants doing these big projects to record and collect data on large numbers of properties. It really, it will help you facilitate your survey work. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I'm gonna very quickly go through the mobile app to show you a few screenshots from this. This is not a how to, how to use the mobile app that's for another day. The Chris Trekker application is actually a series of ap applications that will allow you to interact, first of all, with our own our Chris database. 
Um, Chris Trecker users can view, submit, manage historic above ground resource data using mobile and desktop um, devices. Um, these are just some maps showing um, on the left the mobile app on somebody's phone, and then on the right, are this thing um, called Trekker Manager. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so here, um, you can actually um, delineate a project area. On the right, that's Chris Mobile Pro, where you can pull up existing data, because we will, for these larger scale surveys, you can, we will ask you to, um, Kind of take a look and update some of the data of um, existing properties. So this just happens to be on the right a view of existing data in Chris that you can pull up in our mobile uh, Chris Mobile Pro. Uh, next slide. Um, so this this application is available for Android and iOS devices. It offers ease of data entry in the field in the office. You can export the survey data. Uh, it's a pretty flexible app. Um, this is just showing Chris Trekker Manager. This is a way to manage your uh, survey project. It's part of the desktop app. You can assign, if it's a big survey, you can assign people out in the field. It's got ex expandable map and grid interfaces um, and so on. Um, let's go to the next slide. I want to show you some of the things you could maybe pull out of some of the data you've entered and you want to pull out of Trekker Manager, you can pull out reports. You can pull out inventory forms shown on the right. You can pull out, if you've done a bunch of properties in the center there, we have what we call an annotated list of properties where maybe you've got the primary photo and little description in your recommendation for eligibility. You can pull out ArcGIS shape files, Excel spreadsheets, etc. So there's a lot of cool things you can get out of Trekker, I guess is the point. And then finally, um, for these large, uh, next slide please, for these large scale surveys that we're talking about, um, the consultant is going to complete the survey in Trekker, submit it to us, we'll review, process it. Um, they're also going to provide to us a standalone narrative report that provides historic context, recommendations, and so on. Um, and um, and uh, let's see, I think that's all I have. I just want to mention that we will, you know, as the reviewers determine eligibility, if anything is listed or eligible, we'll send it on to tech. Um, and really te what tech's going to do, they'll ask the questions as to whether or not the introduction of new visual elements, um, whether or not those would diminish integrity. Um, or not, and we're thereby affecting a property's national register eligibility. So, thank you. And I think Beth, or no, who's next? Nancy. Nancy, thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. So, my talk is going to focus on an explanation of the data sets that SHPO reviewers look at to determine, to determine whether a phase one archaeological survey is warranted or not. And then once we make that determination that a phase one archaeological survey is warranted, where we recommend archaeological testing take place within your project area. Beth, could I have the next slide, please? So many agencies rely on the recommendations of the New York SHPO for determining the need for a phase one archaeological survey. And so the screenshot that I've shown here shows a, a relatively small solar facility for which we've asked for an archaeological survey. And the person who entered this into Chris did a great job entering their project because they actually drew the the project area limits um, correctly, or as we like to see them, which is mainly the solar facility that's going to be built within the fence line. And you can see also that it has an access road. So it's that area that's highlighted in light blue. And this is a, a project, like I mentioned, uh, for which we asked for a phase one archeological survey. And the area outlined in green is the area where the archaeological survey actually took place in the field. And the gray shading that you see, those are archaeologically sensitive areas. And I'm going to talk about that in, in my next slide. So, Beth, can I have the next slide, please? 
So again, the gray shading is archaeological sensitivity, and that gray shading is generated by buffered archaeological sites. So there's actually a known archaeological site within that buffered area. And so, and, and I should mention that this map is available online and is accessible to the public. So if your project area falls within one of these gray shaded areas, we're more likely to ask for an archaeological survey. Having said that, it's not 100% of the time. So sometimes you can be outside of a gray shaded area and we'll ask for an archaeological survey. Or you can be inside of a gray shaded area and we may not ask for a survey because what we're doing as well is we're, we're looking at the individual site information. So we're looking at the time period the site dates to that's generating that gray buffering. We're, look, we're looking at um, the type of site it is, whether it's a village site, whether it's a campsite, whether it's a historic homestead. So we're looking um, at all of that information and making, it, making a determination about how sensitive the project area is based on that individual site information, which the public does not have access to. So um, one of the other factors that we also look at is the environmental setting. So we look at, at soils, um, we look at where wetlands, water courses are located. And so if your project area um, encompasses a stream, a wetland, any water body, or is adjacent to it, we're more likely to request an archaeological survey because those are locations that Native Americans prefer to settle in, are locations near um, water sources. Um, again, wetlands, streams, uh, ponds, uh, rivers, things like that. So Beth, could I have the, the next slide? So if we do decide your project area is archeologically sensitive based on the locations of known archeological sites and also environmental factors, um, we then ask for phase 1B archeological testing and the goal of phase 1B is site identification. And when we're asking for phase 1B testing, however, we're not asking for testing of the entire project area in general. So we're asking for archeological testing to take place where there are substantial proposed ground disturbance that's going to be occurring. And we've defined that as grading and excavation more than six inches deep, uh, grubbing, tree and stump removal, and trenches more than three feet wide. So those are the locations where we would recommend that phase 1B archaeological testing take place. Can I have the next slide, please? Conversely, there's areas within solar facilities that we are not going to generally ask for archaeological testing. And those areas encompass uh, the locations of panel arrays, perimeter fencing, and utility poles, especially if there's no grubbing or grading that's going to be involved. So in those areas, we would not ask for phase 1B archaeological testing in general. And I keep saying in general because there are rare instances where we do ask for the entire project area to be surveyed. Um, so for example, if you had a 20 acre solar facility um, and that 20 acres would be the area of development generally within the fence line of that solar facility, then we would ask that all 20 acres be surveyed. Um, irrespective of the type of construction um, that's going to take place. Because once in a great while, we have a project area that's highly sensitive for especially Native American habitation sites and um, human remains or burial sites. And when we think a project area is that highly sensitive, then once in a great while, we do ask for the entire project area to be surveyed. Can I have the next slide, please? So one of the other factors we look at um, when we make a recommendation for where phase 1B testing should occur is we look at your project area and it's sensitized. So we've defined areas of high archaeological sensitivity for archaeological sites as generally those that are within 100 meters of permanent water and on slopes equal to or less than 12% 
within or near to known archaeological sites and locations of standing or demolished historic structures. And for demolished historic structures, they're often called map documented structures. And we go to historic maps like the Beers Atlas um, because sometimes structures appear on those maps that have since been demolished. So we're, we're interested in those sites because that's often where you find his, historic sites. So it's really the overlay of your construction impact with archeological sensitivity um, that determines where we recommend archeological survey to take place. Beth, could I have the next slide? And so I wanted to show you this. This actually graphically represents the overlay of those two factors. Again, um, construction impacts, substantial construction impacts, and um, the environmental setting. So the outline you see in blue is actually the, the proposed solar facility. And then the locations you see that are highlighted in red are where the archeological testing is going to take place. So those are locations of access roads, um, utility trenches that, over, that are over three feet wide and other areas of substantial proposed uh, ground disturbance. And so those are the areas that are going to be archaeologically tested and only those locations. We also have a third option that we've developed to give project sponsors um, design flexibility. So you can choose to test at 100% all high sensitive areas within your project area. So again, if you have a 100 acre project area, and 20 acres of that has been determined to be archeologically sensitive, then you could test those areas um, completely. And best case scenario, if you don't find any archeological sites, you could change the design of your facility and you would not need to come back in for ship or review. So once that 20 acres is cleared, you would not have to come back in to get a second SHPO opinion. For instance, if you would change your project design, because if any of those red components change their location and they still end up in archeologically sensitive areas, then additional archeological testing would be necessary to accommodate those design changes. So that's why we provided you with this other option so that um, you're doing more testing up front, but hopefully in the end, you only are coming into the SHPO for a single review to the archaeology unit, and you don't have to come in and do, you know, addendum phase 1B testing. Could I have the next slide, please? So I've been talking about phase 1B archaeological testing, and the goal again of phase 1B archaeological testing is to identify archaeological sites, both Native American and non-Native American. Native American archaeological sites. And there's two main survey techniques that we use at the phase 1B level. One is a surface survey. Um, and so if a field's been plowed in the past and can be currently plowed, um, that, can, that can happen. And the archaeologists then walk those fields and they stand a certain distance apart, walk the fields looking for artifacts on the surface. The other technique that can be used is shovel testing. And we recommend 16 shovel tests per acre, and they're generally about a foot and a half in diameter and about a foot and a half deep. And they're excavated every 50 feet or 15 meters. And again, it's about 16 shovel tests per acre. And then the soil is passed through a quarter inch screen. And the archaeologists are looking for artifacts in that soil. And I noticed that a question popped up about the SHPO's preference for a surface survey. Um, if we have a preference for one survey technique over the other, we will make that recommendation in our letter back to you. Having said that, either technique is acceptable to the SHPO. So while we make that recommendation and you know, we suggest that you follow it, say, if we want to surface a survey, we're not insistent upon that. So what I also wanted to point out that um, if you see that hill in the background, that is um, one of the best known archeological sites in New York State. It is a Native American quarry site where they're quarrying stone material to make stone tools out of. And this 
was used for literally thousands of years. And so there's archeological sites scattered throughout these fields that, that you're seeing. And so this is actually the location of a, sol of a large solar facility. And when they did the archeological investigation for that solar facility, um, by and large, they did use uh, surface surveying to find archeological sites. And so Beth, could you go to the next, the next slide? And so, as you can imagine, um, they did find material in those fields. And what you're seeing here are the waste material for making stone tools and some of the stone tools themselves. And so, the solar facility had a decision to make, whether they were going to avoid those archaeological sites or not. And what I found with solar facilities, there does seem to be design flexibility, and it seems like a lot of times archaeological sites get avoided, and that's really what we're hoping for. So the SHPO's um, initial recommendation is always for site avoidance. However, if a site cannot be avoided, um, we do additional phases of archaeological investigation. And Beth, can I have the next slide, please? So the next phase of archaeological investigation, again, if you can't avoid the site, then there are additional phases of archaeological survey. So the next phase is called phase two. And the primary goal of phase two archaeological investigation is to better determine the site size, um, the site integrity, uh, whether the artifacts still bear a relationship to each other, and whether the site can answer important research questions. And if the site can answer important research questions, then we make a determination that the site is National Register eligible. And so if the site is not National Register eligible, then we no longer consider that site in the process. So you're allowed to construct on that site, do whatever you need to to put in your project, and we have no further concerns for sites that are not National Register eligible. If the site is National Register eligible, then you have the opportunity again to avoid that archaeological site. And if you can't avoid that archaeological site, as John mentioned in the beginning, we have to mitigate that adverse impact to that archaeological site. And often that's done with a third phase of archaeological survey called data recovery. And I have found it's extremely rare for solar facilities to get to the point where you're doing data recovery. So, but I thought I would mention it to you anyway, because um, it does happen once in a great while. So the goal of data recovery is really to obtain a representative collection of artifacts. So you're preserving that collection for the future. And you're also trying to answer important research questions with that collection so that you can shed more light on the past or get a greater understanding of the past through your study of that artifact collection. You know, we had an interesting mitigation for that Flint Mine Hill solar facility project that I showed you. And again, this is more unusual, but I wanted to bring it up. Like I said, you don't always have to do additional archeology. span We can do other types of mitigation. And for that Flint Mine Solar Facility, what was decided in partnership with uh, the Indian nations that we were consulting with is that we would ask the project sponsor to purchase Flint Mine Hill and donate it to the Archaeological Conservancy, which is a group that conserves archeological sites long-term. And so that will happen with that project, which I think is a huge plus. So that site will remain protected and safe for future generations. That's right, the next slide, please. So I just wanted to, to show you what data recovery looks like, which is that first, third phase of archeological survey work. And it often, often entails um, large scale excavations where you're opening up large portions of the site. And this was a really interesting site that was found in the city of Albany. So there originally was a parking lot on this site and underneath you can see um, many feet of fill. And then underneath that fill, there was a rum manufacturing facility. And you can see that dated to the 18th century and you can see the rum vats um, that were still in existence and there were artifacts associated with this distillery. And so part of that 
uh, data recovery was to give public presentations. You can see the public um, surrounding the site, um, and they were asking questions and learning about archaeology. So that was also part of the project. Um, and then once this excavation was completed, there's a report that's produced, and for all phases of archaeological survey, there's archaeological survey reports that are produced. And then this site was actually so important to the history of Albany that there is an exhibit at the New York State Museum where you can see these rum vats on display and some of the other artifacts that were recovered. So, and I just want to say data recovery is, is time consuming and expensive. So that's why we try to avoid it. And, it, and um, we also are trying to protect archaeological sites for the future. So our preference is that they be avoided and remain in place. Unfortunately, for this site, there was going to be a parking garage constructed here. So we couldn't avoid this site. Could I please have the next slide? So this is my last slide, and I just wanted to talk briefly about submitting archaeological survey reports. So in order to do that successfully, you need to have um, what we call a token, which is actually a link back into CRIS. And we provide that link for you. So if you don't have that token slash link, we ask that you request one from us so that survey report can be uploaded correctly into our system. And we also recommend that archaeological survey reports be submitted by the consulting archaeologists since they need to fill out survey information. Um, and in addition to filling out survey information, if there are any archaeological sites identified, they need to fill out the site form. So we find that it's, it's often easier for archaeological consultants to give us the correct information. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you for your time. And if you ever have any questions, like don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to, to answer questions. Thank you. So hello, everybody. This is Beth. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about how to put a project into our CRIS system. So I could talk for a couple hours about putting things into Chris and all the nuances of it. So this is a really basic um, primer on how to get your project started in Chris. And then once you have the project in the system, uh, both Kathy, Nancy, or I will be helping you with the rest of the consultation process. So I hope this is helpful. Um, uh, for those of you who've been in Chris, it, it looks something like this, but you wonder, at least I would wonder, where do I find that website? My recommendation is to go ahead and do a Google search on NYS Chris. Um, it is the first thing that comes up. Uh, the link is also here at the top. Um, as you can tell, it is a little bit long. And what comes up, depending on how your browser searches, you'll either get this page, which has all of our cultural resource online tools. And for those of you who might be looking for the public um, uh, mobile application, um, its link is on this page. But typically, most people come up with um, this particular screen, which is our landing page. In order to get into the system, you have to agree, agree to the legal disclaimer. So please read it and then agree. If you disagree, you won't get in. And now you are brought into the login page. So you have two choices. You can sign in if you already have an ny.gov ID, or you can proceed as a guest. Using the guest permissions, you can enter everything you need to to get our review started. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'll be using the guest permissions. If you do have a large number of projects that you're consulting with our office on, I recommend getting an ny.gov sign in so you'll get um, more permissions and be able to track your projects a little bit easier than using guest. But we'll start with that. So when you're going in and entering a project for the first time, once you go in as a guest, you come up first with this screen. Now it says find my project. If it's your first time in the system putting a project in or the first time you're going to send a, the project our way, um, you're not going to have a project yet. So you're going to look up a little bit higher on the toolbar and choose submit. All right. Once you choose submit, this next screen comes up and you're going to choose consultation project. 
Now, John um, talked about consultation reviews a little bit, and so did Kathy. Um, these are for either federal, state, or seeker reviews. So 106, 1409, or seeker is our shortcut terminology for those three types of projects. Once you click open, so all right, so you go in and you choose the consultation project, this little screen comes up and you need to click start. Then Chris opens another browser tab, in which case you're going to have the one page submission form to initiate a project. Now, some basics as you go into that one page submission. There are floating buttons. These buttons float as you scroll down the screen. So you have save and continue. So saving throughout entering all the different pieces of information we ask for is always a good idea. If you choose finish later, this means you're saving it and choosing to go do something else for a little while and then coming back in, in which case you'll need a token number in order to get back into that process of entering the information we're looking for. So we'll, we'll show you what that token number is. And at the very end, you're going to submit to SHPO. And I'm going to say submit to SHPO a lot because I can't tell you how many times I get a phone call asking me, like, why didn't we respond? And people did not actually hit submit to SHPO. So you got to do that at the end. All right. So what's a token? A token is the first tracking number that you get at the beginning of a submission. This token number is used before it comes into the SHPO office in order to keep track of it somehow in the computer world. So 12 digit unique number, and I'll show you what one looks like coming up here um, that makes no sense to anyone. It's a random number and it is prior, like I said, to getting a project review number. So once our office accepts the project from its original token and it's turned and accepted into our system as a review project, it gets a, a PR number is what we call it as PR in the middle. Uh, the first two digits are the year. So this was a 2020 project. Now there'll be 21 will be the number here and then a randomly um, generated number at the end. Then as submissions are added to the project, so now you have one project number, additional numbers are added to the end of the project number in order to designate submissions. So these token numbers um, are really only required when you're continuing a submission that you set up here, save and finish later. Um, and you'll use them, you can actually connect them to your project number. So now you're on this one page submission and what are the steps? So there are six basic steps. Who are you? What's your project? Which agency? Project level attachments. So this could be drawings and things. Project location, where is it? And then do you have any above ground resources to tell us about? Okay. So what do these screens look like, right? So contact information. The first thing you're going to want to add is your primary contact information. This is the person who the letter, when we write a letter or uh, correspondence back to you, will be the primary person that this correspondence is sent to. And once you do this, you will get um, the ability to, um, hold on, you'll get a token number for the primary contact. So here highlighted, you can see what a token number looks like. It's long, but you're going to want to keep the email in case something happens to your submission and we can help find it through the token number. You should add any other contacts who would be associated with the project using the add new contact after you've already added the primary. You'll see as you go through these screens when we go live, there is also help over to the the right hand side of the screen and the help will scroll as you go through submitting this information and you can use it to help you um, as you're entering live. Different buttons show up that are available on each of the different steps as you begin to enter in information. Obviously, when you first enter something, editing and viewing is not possible, but once someone is in the system, you can click their line and you can view or edit it if you've typed something in incorrectly. All right, so step two, um, project overview. 
So there's a lot of information, a lot of fields that can go in here. Um, the most important thing is your project name. Again, we're looking for the name of the project, the megawatts, and then the acres that the solar uh, array will cover, as well as the total acres for the entire project. Um, project description is required and should be a short description. It has to be less than a thousand characters. And later on in step four, you can actually attach a Word document or a PDF of the entire scope of work. So this, think of it sort of as an executive summary. The, the next set of check boxes here um, involves ground disturbance is something that I believe all solar projects will need to check. If there is known previous ground disturbance on this project, property, you can check this, another box pops up and you can enter in what you know about previous disturbance. And if you know there are one or more buildings present, you would check this box as well. Type of permit approval is completely optional. You can use it for your, your own tracking. Reference number is a reference number that um, will show up on any correspondence that we may send you. So that's helpful if you have an Army Corps of Engineers number or some other New York State tracking number that you want to make sure matches up when you get our correspondence. All right, step three is agency information. We have to have at least one agency included in the submission, and that would be the primary agency. So here again, you're going to select the, the button that says select primary agency. Go in, a pop-up screen comes up. You can search using the box at the filter at the top. Um, in this case, I chose Army. You'll see two come up, regular Army and Army Corps of Engineers. And in this one, I, I chose the wrong one. It really should be the Army Corps of Engineers for a solar project. I'm pretty sure the Army isn't doing a solar project. Um, and then you would click Add. All right. Once you've added that, you can um, select additional agencies, which is grayed out in the beginning, but becomes active so you can add additional agencies. So you might have Army Corps of Engineers, you might have DEC, um, you might have NYSERDA as other agencies applicable to your project. Project level attachments is a very handy section. Here is where you can add uh, drawings maps, um, any other information that would help us with our review um, on the initial submission. So again, you click Add Attachment, a box pops up, and you'll, you need to title the document that you're uploading. You would select the file from wherever it is, just um, like a Windows uh, file selection, and then choose Upload. And here you can see this, I had uploaded a scope of work. You can continue to add multiple attachments until your complete um, information is uploaded. Each attachment needs to be less than 30 megabits. Um, other words, you, if they're bigger than that, you need to break them up somehow so they'll, they can be uploaded. Project location is done using um, ArcGIS. Um, and this is particularly important um, where the help on the side comes up, and it is quite flexible help and um, pertinent to the section that you're in. So the first question it asks is, can you locate your project by an address? Um, in this case, I entered yes, and I typed in 105 Harris Park Lane in South New Berlin. And it searched, and it brought me to this section of the map. In order to move forward with the next series of questions regarding project location, you need to accept this location. Once you accept the location, additional boxes pop up. And in this case, it wants to know if your project is limited to a 50 square foot area or smaller. So you guys are gonna say no, and another box is gonna pop up and it's gonna say to describe the location of your project. So once you describe the location of the project, the next series of things that need to happen is to draw the project location on the map. All right, so you'll literally click draw project location. You can change the base map in order to help you accurately draw the map location or the APE, which is particularly important for our archeology span review. Um, so you'd start drawing the APE on the, 
on the map and follow the directions. I won't go through these because they, they're, you can, you guys can do it. It's pretty straightforward. So once you have the project location, um, it will show up as a blue um, shaded area. And at which point you can edit this shape. You can also say this is terrible and start over by saying delete project location and go back to redrawing the full section. Blue dots can be dragged to new locations if they are not in the correct location. Gray points um, you can use to drag and add additional vertices to create refinement on the, the APE uh, designation. Once you're done and happy with your shape, you would click stop editing project location and move forward um, on to step six, which is um, built resources. So I'm not going to go through the built resources. I think you're getting the idea of um, how these screens pop up, how you can use the additional help. I want to share a little bit online. Um, and I'm trying to go somewhat quickly so that we still have plenty of time for questions. Um, built resources, before you add the resource, you want to be a little prepared. You need to know the resource type, whether it's a building, structure, object, or site. Um, the property name, and it should be something descriptive. Um, in this case, Schneider Farms Barn is a good example. Um, Please know the year of construction. It doesn't have to be an actual date. It can be um, words, which could be circa 1930 um, or an approximate year. Uh, you need to know the current uses for the building and also a current photo of the build, at least the building's primary facade. So next steps after you've entered everything on the form is again, submit to SHPO. Please don't forget to submit to SHPO. Once you hit click submit, this screen will come up that says this form has been successfully submitted and you can close your browser window. All right, please, please, please remember that. And then what happens next? Of course, there's more. Emails start to come from chris.web at parks.ny.gov. So the SHPO initial consultation submission was received. This means the SHPO office has it in the queue and will be converting it from a token number into a project number. This email is sent to the contacts that you entered from step one. The next thing that happens is the SHPO actually converts the token number into a consultation project and you would get assigned a project number and that comes directly in the email. And from now on, you'll know the project by its project number. So continuing along, um, at some point when the project review is complete and we'd like to send you a response, you'll get an email from again, Chris Webb, with a consolidated response for the project. From this email, you can click the link, go in as a guest, or log in with your ID and you'll receive this screen, which is a response. So you can download our response letter. You can go in the corner and view the project and you can download any attachments or any instructions to respond. Information requests also have a process wheel and this is how you would process a request for an archeological survey. All right, so search is also available um, on the parks, on the online tools website. Um, search criteria can be done, spatial search, and there's a results tab. It's important when you go in as a guest, again, you're gonna get this find my project. If you're doing a search without having a project, you can just go in and search. You do not need to have a project or a project number in order to complete a search. Um, and there is also Chris Mobile, which is a simplified web map version of Chris, which can be used for um, gathering information regarding known historic resources. So I'm hoping we have a few minutes where I can do a tiny bit of live demonstration. So here you can see this is the um, Chris application and I've already done my Google search and it pulled up to the login screen. 
I have to agree to the disclaimer and I'm going to proceed as a guest. All right. So again, if I'm going to submit something, I don't have a project yet, so I'm not going to use this. I'm going to go ahead and click on submit. And we're going to always do a consultation project. And once we start this up, you're going to see right a new tab open up for Chris submit. And it's taking a minute. All right, so as this pulls up, you start to see a little bit of what's happening in the background. The first thing it wants you to do is add your contact information. So you would click on the blue bar and you would add your contact information, at which point these floating buttons would become active. And what I really wanted you to see here is the fact that all along the right hand side of the screen is contextual help to help you fill out um, the information needed for each one of these steps. Right. The other thing I wanted to illustrate was our Chris Mobile application. This Chris Mobile, I think one of the questions was where can you find Chris Mobile? Um, and I'll show you that. This application is a web enabled application. We call it Chris Mobile. It is not actually an app like you might find in the App Store, but it is something that is fairly easy to use on your phone or digital devices or mobile devices. So here is the project that um, Nancy was talking about. And here you see a green square, which is an eligible building. And it will pull up in this Chris mobile application, a little bit of information about the resource. And additionally, you can generate what's called a USN report, which will download the information available in Chris right now. And so that comes up looking something like this. And it has a primary photo and any of the other information, like a statement of significance, construction date, or additional photos that we may have in our system. Okay, so that's another tool that's available. Um, going back to Chris after I've maybe, well, actually, let's just say before I enter my consultation project, I've gone into the Chris system on my desktop and instead I wanna just search. So you don't need to have a project. You would just like to search to see perhaps in your project area, what kinds of buildings or structures might be around. So when you go to the spatial search, you have the opportunity to use county, um, municipality, in order to zoom closer on the interactive map. You can enter an address, and you can also do um, spatial searches by generating a buffer um, and uh, creating rectangles and things like that. So let's take a quick look at one of the buildings that was on Nancy's project. If you use the zip code, it really helps the system find your project a little bit faster. So as you can see, the map now has zoomed over to that particular address. You again see the green dot, just like you saw in the Chris Mobile application. And in this case, it's a little bit different um, and it pulls up a pop-up box. And in this case, you would hit view and it will take you to the screen, which will show you what information we know about that particular eligible resource. All right, so in this case, we have a determination of eligibility, which can be looked at. Um, there is an attachment, which also has the determination of eligibility and um, any photos that we might have available in our system um, can be viewed. And again, remember, you haven't logged in, you haven't created a project, you're just going around and doing some research. On the map, you can see that there are um, the designations of colors, you know, green is eligible, buildings, yellow is listed, red is not eligible. USN districts have um, purple shading, National Register sites have this kind of peachy color, um, and uh, these are, these bright green ones are archaeologically, archaeology surveys. Um, and 
the guest permissions do not have any archaeological permissions, but you can see where surveys have happened. You just can't view those surveys. So if you have questions on those, you can reach out to our archaeology unit. Right. Um, once you have a project number, this um, welcome to Chris screen. I know my project number and I know my email becomes quite handy. And you can search for your project. It should come up if I spelled my name right. And you can take a look at the review process for what the current status of the review going on for your project. So in this case, there's a finding of no historic properties impacted. So this review is actually complete, but you can see the under attachments that there was an effect finding letter sent to the project um, contacts. And if, for instance, somebody lost the email, you can go in this way and actually find and download the effect finding. Right. You can also see if a review is open or closed and who it is that might be reviewing your project using this particular um, inquiry. Those were the main things that I wanted to very quickly run through. Um, hopefully that was helpful for everyone. And now I'm going to turn it over to John, who will talk a little bit more to us. Thanks, Beth. Um, and this is just a really quick wrap up at the end before we get to the uh, Q&A. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the end result of all our, our projects are either there's no adverse effects or there are adverse effects or impacts. Um, if you do find yourself uh, you know, trying to figure out what those are, Adverse effects are defined pretty clearly in both laws, and it's when an undertaking alters directly or indirectly, and of course directly is uh, tearing down a building, impacting an archaeological site. Those are direct impacts. Indirect impacts are uh, visual impacts or setting impacts. So if your project alters any of those characteristics of a historic property that qualify for inclusion of the national in, in the National Register, that's an adverse uh, finding. And Again, as I mentioned, it, it can include new visual elements being brought into the setting of a historic property. Uh, they are always looked at, again, as diminishing the integrity of the property uh, by altering its location, design, materials, workmanship, feeling association, or in the case of solar properties, projects, uh, setting. And setting, of course, refers to the character of a place in which a property played its historic role, um, as we talked about with uh, rural properties. Uh, previously. Next slide, Beth. So an example of that, this is in Niagara County, and this is the Pound Hitchens house. It's a great uh, stone house right on the canal. Um, this was bought seven years ago when it was in uh, a dire straits. The windows had been boarded over. It was in terrible condition. And the property owner, when the a previous owner sold the farm and broke the property up, uh, they acquired the stone house. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, uh, two solar projects have been proposed side by side, uh, just alongside the property. And in, in the slide in the image below, you can see the dot that marks the house um, and its National Register listed property. So you see the boundary for that property in red, and then you see the project boundary um, in that uh, blue shade uh, with the green buffer around it being the Archeo survey that was done. And you see there are two projects side by side. The other property is a cemetery. And with the Pound Hitchens house, because originally its setting was agricultural, uh, you know, the uh, solar farm filling the, the former agricultural land alongside of it uh, does have a visual impact on its historic setting, which is this kind of open uh, farm quality that the property has always um, had historically. Uh, next slide. So this is a view from kind of standing in front of the house, just panning over to where the solar uh, project is going in. You can see the field. You can kind of see the property line uh, where it goes from uh, that that small brush row uh, back to tilled field. And the developer of this project submitted to us a uh, mitigation plan to help it demonstrate that the project uh, visual impacts could be uh, mitigated. Uh, Beth, next slide. So they digitally placed the solar array field as well as a berm into the uh, the image here, so that we can get a better idea of whether a berm would be sufficient in helping to buffer the historic house 
uh, from the, the array, we felt that it still wasn't enough that the uh, solar field uh, really does change the character of the property. Uh, so they uh, proposed uh, planting the berm with a, a fairly uh, thick uh, multi-seasonal planting plan. Beth, next slide. And this shows the five-year uh, growth of the prop, prop uh, the uh, uh, mitigation berm and plantings. But as you can see, it would take five years to get to this, and trees are not permanent. Uh, so ultimately, of the, this is one of the three projects that we did find an adverse impact finding on, and um, are working with that company now uh, to find ways to mitigate that. Um, part of which is the berm and plantings they're proposing, but looking for kind of longer term protection with that berm. Um, and possibly some historic uh, offset mitigation to go with it. Next slide, Beth. So, what do we look for in mitigation? Uh, generally, we, we look for uh, uh, avoidable impacts to when, when it's an archaeological site and they can't be avoided. As Beth Nancy talked about, it's a phase three recovery plan. We don't see a lot of that in archaeology, in the uh, solar uh, uh, farm uh, development. When it's buildings, we recommend mitigation projects. Uh, generally have historic significance. They should uh, serve a public interest. Uh, they should be a good investment, which means that when they're proposed, uh, whatever's done can be completed as part of the mitigation. And it should be appropriate uh, for the level uh, of importance of that resource. So every project is different. Uh, Beth, if you want to hit the next slide. Uh, every project's different. There are no two mitigation projects that are the same. Everyone is negotiated, although they all have kind of the same elements, and uh, it's usually about trying to protect or enhance the qualities of a historic property as part of mitigation. Uh, we look at things like the number of resources affected. Uh, are those resources uh, listed on the register? Are they National Historic Landmarks? Uh, are they uh, projects, properties, which might be uh, uh, part of a historic district that's impacted? So there's a number of resources. We look at the scale of the effect. A two uh, megawatt wind uh, solar farm is very different than a 500 megawatt solar farm. So the scale is going to change depending on the scale of your project. Um, and, and as I mentioned, what are the significance of the resources? Are they eligible? Are they listed? Are they national historical landmarks? Um, are they properties that have visual importance to them? Or are they properties that can tolerate more impact to their visual setting? And then we also look at community interest as part of our mitigation. Uh, next slide. Who enforces a mitigation plan? Mitigation plans are developed as part of a letter of resolution or a memorandum of agreement with the state or federal agency involved in your project. And they have a time limit for completion. Uh, and uh, they usually uh, require that a developer provide an annual update if it's a long term mitigation project. Uh, and any permit, any uh, mitigation plans become part of the conditions of permits that are issued. By Army Corps as part of their wetlands permits, or as by DEC as part of their speedies or other uh, programs that might be impacting or might be required by your project. Uh, next slide, Beth. So uh, that that kind of brings us to the end of the formal presentation. Uh, as uh, you were told at the beginning by Nasirda, this will be available. Uh, but here are our contacts, and again, uh, uh, for Beth, Kathy, and Nancy. Uh, they have a staff that review most of these projects. So uh, once you get working with us, different regions have different staff people assigned to them. So you get to know kind of who's doing your reviews. Uh, but certainly if you have specific questions, starting with the uh, unit heads is a good place to start. And uh, we can ensure that the projects you're working on uh, move smoothly. And that leaves us with about 20 minutes for questions. Um, I think the way we left it is that uh, I'm going to read through the questions that haven't been answered so far and um, uh, offer our uh, our thoughts and kind of toss it to the staff that uh, would best be able to answer them. So as I read through here, I know uh, Nancy, uh, the question about uh, uh, you had touched on it, uh, whether we prefer tilling fields uh, and surface inspection uh, where there are solar fields. Um, you want to just follow up on that? You know, either technique is acceptable to the SHPO. So even though we might make a recommendation, whether we would like surface survey over shovel testing, we will not insist upon it. 
So if for some reason you can't plow and surface survey an archaeological, or I'm sorry, a project area, um, you can go ahead and do the shovel test. So either technique is acceptable to the shovel. Uh, the next question asked about if residential buildings are exempt as well as commercial industrial buildings currently in use that may be 50 years old or older. Kathy, do you want to respond to that? Um, no, they, we look at, uh, it doesn't matter. So are they still in use? We look at anything. Uh, so no, they are not exempt. And the next question uh, was, what counts as total, everything within the fence line, acreage, road coverage? Uh, generally, what we've been saying is for visual impacts, what we were talking about when we say 20 acres or less, is the coverage of your panel area. So that's not the fence line, that's the physical space occupied by your solar array. So, um, you know, length and width, width of the arrays within your uh, fence line uh, added up, what's that look like? Uh, for for visual impact, for archaeology, if you have uh, roads going in or other things, uh, that would calculate indeed into your your uh, uh, impact area uh, for archaeology. If you're adding new roads um, or uh, uh, excavating for new roads or hardening roads or things like that, uh, can you uh, uh, can you do a Chris search without submitting a full consultation back? Sorry, um, I thought we sort of went through that in the presentation, but absolutely, please do it. Please like look up your home, do as many searches as you like in uh, Chris um, using the guest permissions. You just pick search on the top or using the, the Chris um, mobile application. Thanks. Kathy, uh, this is for you. If an, if an adjacent building is on private property, the property owner is either unavailable or unwilling to give access um, how do you, what do you need to provide to us for uh, us to review it? Sure. Well, whatever, don't trespass. <laughs> We're not encouraging anyone to trespass, so um, don't do that. Um, you know, unless you have permission to go onto the property. Uh, no, do your best to take uh, photographs from the public right of way. Okay. Thank you. Um, we don't really Thanks. want aerial photos because we can get aerial photos ourselves. So do what you can from the street, uh, the public right of way. Thank you. Uh, the next question deals with the mobile app. Uh, it doesn't state whether it's the Chris mobile app or the Trekker mobile app, since both were talked about. So do, I know both you had uh, mentioned the uh, Chris mobile app location, but Kathy, do you want to explain about the Trekker access? Yeah, um, yes. So I would say that um, if you um, want to use Trekker, um, then you need to let us know that. And again, um, I would recommend Trekker, like let's say you've got, um, you know, I don't know, 15 or more properties it, that you're going to be inventorying. It might be worth your time to actually uh, let us know and we'll get you going in Trekker. We, you know, ask that you just give us a little bit of information and then we'll turn that on and get you going in Trekker. You just have to let us know. Thanks. Our next question, how does SHPO define ground disturbance is the first question. Uh, if we have a layout and we do anticipate a uh, zone of visual impact study is needed, can we still submit a project for review so that we can better understand potential uh, phase 1A, 1B needs? So I think that's a kind of a two part question. Right, so, so for ground disturbance, we generally define the project area limits for archeology span as everything that's gonna be in that fence line. And in addition, any, any access roads. So that's how, that's the area that we initially look at when assessing the sensitivity of the project area. And regarding phasing of your submissions, you can submit a project to us without, uh, so you can submit originally talking about the archeology span and we're gonna respond with, uh, you know, what we believe may be needed for the ZVI, uh, but you don't have to have both prepared when it comes in. So you can start the consultation with us and, and we'll, you know, work with you to let you know 
what we think is appropriate or maybe needed. But again, starting early in the process uh, with us uh, may actually mean that you will be, uh, you know, preparing and presenting less than uh, less than you might have if you hadn't talked to us. So, um, Kathy, I think you probably agree that that consultation is good to have early on. Indeed, yes. Uh, next question was about can, can an applicant create a dummy project or can a company put a dummy project in to uh, see how the system works? And that's not really how the system's designed. Once you hit submit, it's real. Uh, so there isn't a, um, a test system out there, but Beth, maybe you can offer some guidance. Well, I get, if you are looking to do some more training with your staff, you can reach out to us and we can see if we can set something up. Um, sometimes I've done like a uh, share screens thing where you can, we can be in the test system and do some testing and show you what's going on. Thanks. Uh, the next question was about the solar guidance, if it's in the process of being updated. If so, uh, what kinds of changes can we anticipate? Well, there's really two areas that we're working on. The RTO section, uh, we're currently, uh, we, we have revised and we haven't quite put it on the, the uh, um, Solar guidance yet because we're waiting for today to uh, kind of wait and see what comments we get and then uh, progress from there. And we've also been looking at making some uh, additional changes to better clarify what's needed for the zone of visual impact areas for above ground survey, how uh, to clarify the the acreage. And also, it's a good point time to 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 mention that you know it says 20 acres, it says 50 acres. If your project comes up to 21 acres. Uh, talk to us. Um, you know, they were generally based on what we've been seeing, and we tried to get the best groupings of projects that we could so that uh, we could better define what might be necessary as you get to the larger end of each of those categories. So, again, if your projects fall close to a category below, give us a call or reach out to the staff um, and we can talk about the project. Kathy, did you want to add anything else to that? No, but I would agree that I, I see a comment later that we are getting a lot of projects where the solar arrays are somewhere in that, you know, 25 acres, 26. So it's, we're starting to get a little bit more of those. So, yeah, we'll kind of re, based on today, we'll revisit the above ground guidance. Um, the next question deals with uh, our, our GIS data, I believe, and whether or not this GIS data is integrated into uh, other agencies' GIS mapping and approval process. Our GIS data is in DEC's mapper, so when you go to that site and you know use their mapping system, it drills down through all of the, the various environmental components, including ours. Um, I do not know how often they're updating our data in that layer. It was supposed to be fairly regularly, uh, but you may want to also just check Chris, which is a real time system. So when you open Chris and look at it, uh, you're seeing the data as we're entering it uh, the day before uh, for at least um, eligible buildings and archeology. span uh, National register lags a little bit because those projects come up, are reviewed every three months. So it takes a little longer for uh, um, active and our projects to make it to the list, but that'll give you a, a pretty good idea. Uh, are there a uh, minimum project uh, size? Uh, is there a minimum project size? Uh, yeah, uh, this this uh, author had asked about 10 panels. Yeah, I mean, generally residential scale solar, uh, we're not reviewing. Um, so, uh, you know, if it's a residential project, we, we don't even add those to our numbers. Um, if, if it's a NYSERDA project, we're going to review it if it's if it's being funded by NYSERDA. Um, but if it's a tax uh, break or something like that, we don't see it. For those small projects, generally, unless you put them in the front of the house in a historic district, we're going to sign off on them pretty easily. Or if you happen to be in a very historic house with very historic archaeology around it, and there's a lot of ground disturbance associated with the project. When we see it, we're probably going to flag it. Uh, so generally, it's not going to be an issue, but you know, there's that rare case where it might be. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think I just explained the next question, which asked about smaller projects and the requirements between 20 and 30 acres. Um, you know, small projects tend to fit well within 20 acres and now closer to 30 as the technology evolves. Again, we're looking at panel size, not um, uh, uh, panel size, not uh, uh, enclosure size. And when you do get up to about 30 acres of panels, uh, we do then begin to feel that the visual impacts do kind of change. So that's uh, that's why we've set that guidance where it is. Um, the question about 50 years old or older, does that refer to the start date of the tax parcel? Uh, usually, if you look at the tax record, it'll tell you the approximate date of construction. Uh, they are notoriously bad as you get past uh, earlier than 1900, uh, then everything seems to be 1910. So, uh, usually we, we um, you know, it's a good it's a good place to check first of the tax tax records in the municipality. Uh, but if we see something or something clearly appears not to be, you know, modern, you probably are better off uh, photographing it. We're going to look at when it comes in, we, we're probably going to look at an aerial view using Bing or, or Google. And usually just from the rooftops, we can kind of tell if there's something there that's not being picked up. Kathy, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I know a lot of um, consultants refer to historic maps that can be helpful. You reach out to the local historian. but you know, if you don't know, that's okay. You know, take your best guess, and we often can determine by generally a time frame by perhaps architectural style, for example. So just do your best uh, guesstimate of the date. Now that's all questions I see. Now Beth had asked about just adding one more note about uh, submitting additional information to Chris. Yeah, so I had forgotten to mention that you can submit additional information to us kind of blind um, by using the submit additional information, which is on the, the submit section of Chris. This would be useful if, for example, you have an approval letter from us or a clearance, and for whatever reason, the project area changes. Perhaps you decide you're going to build the solar field in the neighboring farm field rather than the one that was previously submitted to our office, or perhaps the APE changes or the area of coverage for the solar panel changes as you've progressed with more detailed designs. So that can just be submitted to us using um, submit um, information on a previously um, accepted project. And it's super easy. You can just do it with the project number and your email. And it's much like um, sending an email. It's basically a subject line. And then you would attach the documents like a new map, like a new scope of work, um, an explanation of what changes. Any of those things would just simply be uploaded. And Beth just brought up a good point. If your project scope changes, if you come into us very early in the development project process, and by the time you get to your local seeker process, your uh, site plan has changed, um, roads have been moved, uh, or other things have significantly changed. A few arrays being shifted within the boundary is not a problem, but if the, the boundary itself uh, changes dramatically or the project shifts, uh, you're probably going to want to come back into us uh, because it may impact uh, permitting once the state or federal agency talks to us if the project uh, uh, design has changed substantively from what we originally saw or approved. All right. Um, with that, I don't see any other questions. Um, Nyserta, do you folks want to jump in at this point? Hi, this is Candace Rossi. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining today and especially our colleagues over at CHIPO for giving a really informative presentation. Um, and as I said, their contact information was on the screen, so please feel free to send them an email or reach out to us here at NYSERDA, and we're also happy to field the questions and help as best we can. So just want to thank everyone for joining today. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you.